and now she is currently professor at Johns Hopkins University based in the United States. So Lori, we, we welcome you to this virtual meeting and thank you so much for arranging to do this late your evening so that so many of our colleagues around the, the region are able to participate. Great, so can you see the screen now? We can, yes. Okay, good. Well, that's quite the formal introduction. <laughs> I don't <laughs> feel that important, um, but I'm, oh, but you are. <laughs> I'm really pleased to be with everyone today and this evening. Um, because we don't know each other very well, and I'm hoping that perhaps we can uh, work together more over time, it's a little bit hard for me to put together something that's going to be, uh, you know, directly geared to the challenges that you face. But I'm hoping that I can offer a little bit of an overview tonight. Um, and then over time, as we talk, I'll have a better idea of the challenges you are facing in your programming and, and maybe in future webinars, we can even be more specific to um, some of your needs. So um, I wanted to start by just introducing very briefly the Prevention Collaborative, because um, this is actually a, a new initiative, well, relatively new initiative, um, that I'm part of, along with colleagues uh, around the world. And it's really an effort for us to come together um, and try to strengthen ourselves and other key actors to be able to move effectively into the prevention space. Um, many of us have had experience over the years working on survivor-centered response and support to women and, and their children who have experienced violence. But as I know you all um, know already, you know, we really can't treat our way out of this problem. We need to really think longer term about how to prevent violence before it starts and also how to reduce the burden that violence places on women and families. So we as an organization are really trying to focus on capacity strengthening um, and, and sharing of lessons learned both from research and the evidence that's being generated through research, but also practice-based learning. And so the things that we are, that you and others learn through doing and refining over the years, and then merge that with feminist principles. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about what we're all about, um, you'll see on the screen the web page, and we can talk more about that later. But just to give you a sense of of where I'm coming from in terms of this current work. Um, so what I wanted to try to do this evening is a few pieces of a big puzzle that we're all struggling to figure out how to put together, which is how do we really take on uh, preventing and reducing violence? And I thought I'd start with just some a couple of basic observations about <clears throat> what I call the geography of, of intimate partner violence. Um, in my world, um, as, as Melissa said, she introduced me as an epidemiologist and, and, and basically we study how to prevent disease or, or negative um, outcomes and also the spatial distribution. So, how do different communities um, you know, uh, experience which areas have high violence and which have low violence? And so uh, another way to think about that is sort of the geography or the patterning of violence in our communities. Um, then I wanna to touch just a bit on some of the current evidence base. So what are we learning from research? Um, and I'll be drawing on a range of research. I couldn't begin in half an hour to cover everything, but I pulled out a few things that I thought you might find interesting and, and, and begin to start um, 
start to have a dialogue about some of the different strategies that are proving promising. Um, as I said, I've also kind of tried to identify a few quote unquote successful programs or things where there's evidence that suggests that we're actually reducing levels of violence. And then just to make a few comments on what do we see across those programs that seem to indicate a higher likelihood of being able to reduce violence. So that's our agenda for the night. Um, and I plan to try to talk for maybe half an hour and then we can open it up for a conversation and to take questions and, and reflections. So thinking back to that geography question, one of the things that I think is really important for us to focus on, and I think we don't do it enough, is actually the large differences, the variations that exist in the prevalence of violence across setting. And it's something that we don't like to talk about very much because it feels like we're saying, oh, this country is better than that country or has come further or whatever. But, what we, but we have to actually start to recognize that there really are very large differences in levels of violence both across countries, but also between country, within countries. And so this is just back to the old data from the multi-country study um, of domestic violence and women's health. And I just highlighted uh, a couple of figures here. So this is the percent of women who experienced physical or sexual violence by a partner in the past 12 months. And that's a very common metric that we use. And what you see here is in Ethiopia province, which is one of the sites, it's a rural area of Ethiopia, 54% of women in this study reported having experienced intimate partner violence in the past 12 months. Now you compare that to this Japan city here, which is actually Yokohama, or Serbia city, which is over on the right-hand side here. I don't know if you can see that little uh, cursor that I'm using, but anyway, <laughs> okay, is also, um, is Belgrade. And, and you see both of those are under 4%. So that's more than an order of magnitude difference. Um, in the levels of violence that women are experiencing over the last year. Now, if we go to the next slide, I pulled out, and you probably all are familiar with this picture, um, but it kind of demonstrates some of the variation in the levels of intimate partner violence across the Indo-Pacific region. And what we see here is that the lighter green um, is the level of, or the percentage of women who have experienced IPV within their lifetime. So experienced it with any partnership at any point in their life. The dark green, now I've lost my little cursor, the dark green here is the percent that have experienced it within the last 12 months. Now, what's interesting about looking at this slide is you see is the size of the bubbles, right? Tell you about the relative burden, like the percentage of women. So here over in Kiribati, we have almost 70% of women having experienced violence within their lifetime, compared to over here in Laos, where 15% have experienced violence within their lifetime. The reason this slide is, I think, particularly interesting is because you start to see that in some countries, let me see if I can find my little cursor, it keeps disappearing. In some countries like Timor-Leste over here, what you see is that there's not a very big difference between the percentage of women who are experiencing violence currently 
and those that have ever experienced it. So these two circles overlap a lot. And what that means is that um, basically, if you've ever experienced violence in Timor-Leste, uh, in all likelihood, you're still experiencing it. And what's interesting and important about that is that it tells you, among other things, how likely it is that women are able to leave relationships. So, for example, I'm just going to see if I can get this. Uh, I highlighted here three countries, the Maldives, Australia, and New Zealand. And the reason I'm pointing to those is not only are there, um, or let me just start, is, is one of the reasons I'm pointing to those is because if you look at the dark circle, you see how tiny it is relative to the green, to the lighter green. Oh, sorry, you guys. Uh, and what that means is, for example, in New Zealand, in Australia, only even though 25% of women in Australia have experienced violence at least once in their lifetime, only 2% are currently in an abusive relationship. Likewise, in New Zealand, while 33% have had at least a slap or something in their lifetime, only 6% are currently experiencing it. And I think partly that's because the conditions, the social and economic conditions for women in New Zealand and Australia allow them to leave partnerships that put them at risk. So this helps us start to see how tracking on both 12 month level of violence or current violence, as well as lifetime becomes important. And actually for purposes of prevention planning, it's much more important to be looking at current levels of abuse because that can then help us see hot spots and it also can help us get a handle on the women who are who are in abusive relationships right now and how easy it may be for them to leave so one point i want to make is while oftentimes we report on violence in terms of a country level average it's really important for us to remember that the differences within a country or even within a city within or a municipal region are as big as between countries so what you see on this a slide is on the right hand side is a map of Afghanistan and the co it's color coded in the sense that the light colors the light yellow are areas of Afghanistan where six to 15 percent of women have experienced violence uh, within their lifetime um, this is again intimate partner violence whereas the dark red is 76 to 92 percent and so these are all just pro provinces or districts within afghanistan and you can start to see how if you're actually planning both for services and for prevention you can use these levels to try to think more strategically about where you need resources and where you need programming So that's all I really wanted to say about geography. Um, I, I like to spend a little bit of time on that because we've all become so familiar with the advocacy statistics and things about one in three women will experience violence in their lifetime. And that's a true statement, but within that statement, we lose a lot of the finely grained information that we really need in order to think about programming. So one of the things I just wanted to start with here as we start to think about building a strategy is it's to acknowledge that I'm sure all of you who are working 
at a national or a district or something level in a country, or you're working on Spotlight or, or, or some, um, some national level program, you have to think about a range of different pieces of the puzzle in terms of developing an integrated strategy. So that includes obviously on the top quadrant to the right, uh, you know, what kinds of services and response that women, children, and others need in terms of, of, of dealing with uh, women and children who've already experienced violence. We also have the whole issue of political will. And I'm sure that you know, advocacy agenda, as well as core support to women's organizations and women's movements to hold, to keep the pressure on governments and the like is a part of any kind of viable strategy. I know a lot of you and a lot of the region has spent quite a bit of time around access to justice and how to ensure that laws are in place and, and that police are trained and the like. Here's an area where I think <clears throat> one of the things that we often miss in our strategy is, is really spending a lot of time and energy and program effort to try to get the word out about the laws and what they say because law probably in many of these settings, especially those that are the most fragile <clears throat> or con conflict or post-conflict uh, affected, it, the law is, is a difficult implement, I mean, it's, it's difficult to actually get implemented for the purposes of helping individual women um, because of all the barriers and the attitudes and all the things that I'm sure you encounter every day in your work. But one thing law can do is help redefine the boundaries of acceptable behavior. And so if nothing else, having people know that a certain act or a certain behavior or practice is no longer legally acceptable is a, is, can be a, a way of encouraging social norm change, but only if people really know about the changes <clears throat> and, and have begun to internalize it. Finally, the part that I am going to talk more about tonight is this prevention um, quadrant here. Um, and I wanted to just acknowledge that there's other things also going on that I think as a field, and, and, and many of you are probably already involved with, which is I think in it, uh, increasingly, there is interest and demand from what I call sectoral programs. So government programs that really are not about violence, but are, incur are increasingly encountering violence or encouraged to take on board violence. So infrastructure, road projects with house, you know, how that may affect sexual exploitation of young women. Um, social protection programs and the role that cash transfers uh, may play in terms of reducing um, levels of violence. Uh, another thing is over here is, is um, harmful practices. And I know that many donors and, and you and women are, are quite deeply involved in working on some of those issues, whether that be sorcery or FGM, FGC. Um, there's also, I think, more work that we need to do in terms of opportunities to partner with the private sector. Um, and I've been impressed with some of the programming I've seen in terms of trying to start to encourage and work through, for example, energy sector to deal with issues of sexual harassment. And finally, I think all of us have been, you know, both recognized and have really been pushing for the need for some core funding to civil society groups and strengthening of those institutions. So all of these things are obviously part of a strategy but what I want to talk about tonight is, is more or less this quadrant here, 
of what we can and should be doing in terms of thinking more about prevention programming. So I was asked by Melissa to offer a little bit of a, a take on the state of the evidence um, it, with respect to what works, so to speak. Um, and I wanna say first, just a little bit about the notion of evidence. One of the things that has been happening, which is both quite a good thing and also has some uh, problems associated with it, is there's been a real emphasis in the last five to seven years or even 10 years on trying to develop a research base about how well our programs are working. Um, and many of us have, many programs have had for a long time about, you know, end of project evaluations where we send people out and they do interviews and they review the materials um, and they look at monitoring and they kind of try to glean important lessons learned about how well the program worked and, and what kinds of lessons might be important if for moving forward. Um, what's different now though is that there's now been a whole big emphasis on a different kind of evaluation or evidence, which is trying to evaluate quantitatively, did um, different interventions actually reduce either the overall level, the frequency and severity of violence or prevent new cases or of women becoming victim in the first instance to violence. And those are called impact evaluations. So they're really, they're not just any quantitative evaluation, but they're, they're evaluations that are designed in such a way that you can actually estimate the level of impact. So for example, you can say things like violence was reduced 20% or the frequency of violent episodes was reduced 16%. So there's a lot of emphasis now on what's called community randomized trials or, or randomized trials, which is the type of, of research design that allows you to make those kinds of determinations, which says quantitatively, yes, we influence violence and we did it by this much. So that's not the only kind of evidence that's important because qualitative is very important. Our program evaluations are very important. But what I'm gonna be talking about for the next series of, of slides is what has been learned recently from these type of impact eva evaluations. So the ones that are really measuring, are we having putting a dent into the level of violence? So, you'll note already <laughs> that most of what I've been sharing with you tonight is around intimate partner violence. And that's because most of the research that has been done to date has really focused on domestic violence and violence in the family um, to, not to the exclusion, but, but basically we, we know a lot more about that and um, therefore, <clears throat> I'm gonna be focusing on that tonight. Um, it's, it is in some ways, you know, a shame, not a shame, but it would be nice if we had an equal amount of evidence for some of the other types of violence that uh, burden women and their children. Um, but if you're starting somewhere, and we're actually quite a young field, with respect to figuring out exactly how to reduce violence or to prevent violence. The family and violence in relationships is not a bad place to start, partially because it's the most common form of violence that women face in most uh, globally and in most countries. Um, it's also highly influential on children and children who grow up in homes that where they observe violence or 
they are um, they observe their mothers being beaten or they themselves are are traumatized are at much higher likelihood to either go on to perpetrate violence or to be victims in the future so since the home is sort of the crucible of where people learn about gender and they learn about how to resolve or conflict or strategies it it is a place where if we can start to tackle violence and socialization in the home it should have spillover effects to other areas so we now have about oh well we have over a hundred of these impact evaluations, these kind of complicated efforts to evaluate complex interventions and figure out whether or not they're actually influencing partner violence. And, and a lot of them have actually been, um, well, all of those ones, that hundred that I'm mentioning are all from the global south. Um, there's a lot more information actually from the African continent than there is in other parts of the world. I don't mean in terms of any evidence, but I meant these particular types of studies, these, these trials that allow you to quantify your impact. Although there is increasingly some in India, Pakistan, and, 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 and other areas. And there's just been, as I'm sure most of you know, you know, quite a good kind of overview of other types of evidence in the Pacific context funded by the Australians. So I think the take home message, and I'm sure it's one you've already heard from others, is that actually prevention is possible in project relevant timeframes. And what I mean by that is that we honestly didn't know, um, I would say eight years ago, whether or not anything that we were doing in the women's movement or in international development was really having a measurable impact on reducing future violence or reducing levels of current violence. And I think we can safely say now that we actually have quite a bit of evidence that we can do this and we can do it within not generations, but we can do it within three to five years um, or two to five years. And so what we have is more than 10, actually quite a few more than 10 right now examples of programs that have been through this kind of rigorous evaluation that have achieved reductions. What we're seeing is that we're actually better able to reduce ongoing violence. So reduce the frequency and severity of violence amongst women who are in relationships where there's already violence than we are yet to prevent uh, women um, from entering or finding themselves in violent relationships or, or preventing violence in the first instance. But both are important, both in terms of, of women's um, own assessment of their lives and in terms of health burden, in terms of exposure of children and the like. So the data that we have, the evidence um, is it was until recently very short term. And so some of the early research projects would only follow up for maybe six months or at most a year. And then more recently with funding from the international, the UK's International Development Organization, DFID, they funded a series of these large impact evaluations around the world. Um, and those were extended out two years post the, the end of the intervention. So we now have um, some evidence that the impacts that we were seeing are actually sustained for up to two years. Um, we'd like to have longer and we need to 
to, to follow up longer, but right now that's pretty much where we're at, just so that you're aware. Um, most of the success that we've seen, the programs that, that do um, seem to reduce frequency and severity of violence are focused or achieving that with groups of individuals who are engaged actually in, um, a, in uh, the program itself. So the direct beneficiary. So people who are involved in critical reflection groups or, or the like. Um, one of the challenges is, is that while we've learned pretty well how to help people change their attitudes and behaviors and build healthier lives, if we work with them intensely in a program, what we really need to be thinking about is how do we reduce violence at a community level, so across a whole community, not just with the set of people that we're actually working with. And, and we do have a few examples of having been able to do that, and I'll talk a bit about that. But I think it's important always to contextualize because the same statistic where someone says, oh, this program, reduce violence by, let's say, 30% or 40%, if it's only amongst the people enrolled in the program, that's a far smaller Im impact than even a smaller percentage reduction, but that is spread across a wider population. So it's important to kind of contextualize that. On the left-hand side of the screen here is just a box which is from a recent review that was the end of project report of the What Works to Prevent Violence um, Against Women and Girls project that was funded by DFID that I just mentioned. Um, and it's something which, it's quite a dense document. <laughs> But what you'll see is they break interventions down or programs down into different types like economic interventions, relationship and family level interventions, and then they review each of them. I'm going to give you the high level messages from that, but if you're interested in more detail, um, I can, we'll, we'll make sure that you have access to that document. So there are many, many types of strategies for prevention. And there's also many different ways to, as I call, say, cut the pie. <laughs> because many of the interventions, many programs that you may have heard of, whether you're, heard, you're talking about SASA, or you're talking about Stepping Stones, or you're talking about Indashakira, or any of these programs that people have have evaluated actually oftentimes include a variety of different strategies and it's not so easy to figure out how best to bucket them so to group them which intervention should go under what type of strategy um, you'll see that pe sometimes when you read reviews of evidence you'll see the same program categorized in two different ways that's just a function of the fact that there's lots of ways to group programs together. So what I'm gonna to do tonight is talk about the strategies that are highlighted on this slide. So I'm gonna briefly talk about economic and social empowerment group-based interventions. I'll say a bit about some gender-aware gender parenting programs one on community mobilization or community activism, something on working with couples. Uh, one example, a very ex interesting example of working on alcohol and mental health, and then one on an observation about legal and policy reform. So this is just another way to think about the strategies, um, and, and this is just putting different kinds of strategies, different types of programs 
um, into where they fit in the ecological model. So some of our strategies, for example, reducing um, harmful drinking, for example, would be working at an individual level. Um, work, training adolescent girls to, in self-defense would be working at an individual level. Couples programs work at a relationship level. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, so uh, this is just another way to conceptualize the different buckets of interventions. So one of the things in thinking about programming, one of the first tasks is to really think about what is it that we're trying to achieve. And obviously, if you know, we're trying to do violence prevention, we're trying to both reduce new cases of violence, meaning women who are not experiencing violence from, from becoming entering violent relationships, but we're also trying to reduce frequency and severity. I think it's really important as we start to do evaluations and plan these kind of programs is that we start to get away from siloed programming, meaning something that's just focused on violence, because what we're learning is that the same interventions that seem to be reducing violence are also having other kinds of impacts. They're decreasing harsh discipline of children. They're improving mental health. Sometimes they're improving women's power to, for example, uh, use family planning. And so I just encourage us that as we think about programming in violence, that we think about capturing the impacts of our work on some of these other outcomes, partly because we need to know if there's other outcomes, but it also means that we can recruit other constituencies like sexual and reproductive health people or mental health pe people concerned about mental health to help support and, and encourage violence prevention work. So, Going back to the very first bucket of interventions, and it's one that is called economic and social empowerment. Um, I'm going to do a talk, uh, a webinar for you guys later on, just specifically on economic empowerment and um, violence against women. But here's a little uh, precursor to that. So one of the earliest forms of prevention um, that was evaluated was a, a trial or an intervention that basically built off of microfinance program. So a, 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 a um, commercial microfinance program in South Africa where women got loans for business development. And they put on top of that platform, on top of the loan group, a participatory gender training. Um, so it was life skills and gender training that women who were coming to pick up their loans and repay their loans would also participate in. Um, and since then, this type of approach has been tried in a number of places, sometimes building off of of microfinance, sometimes building off of village savings and loan associations or savings groups, and sometimes actually building off of other kinds of vocational training or employment training. But the key element here is that they include a gender transformative piece. Um, <clears throat> now, we have some effective programs in this category. And we also have some unaffect, or some programs which when evaluated did not show a reduction. Um, most of the ones that seem to work comprise at least 12 months of interventions and have 10 or more of the kind of gender empowerment um, sessions. So many, many of you may have heard, and this was one of the very first uh, 
programs that was evaluated. It's called the Image Project in South Africa. And again, this was microcredit and gender training. And what this study demonstrated was a significant decline in violence that was sustained over two years. So amongst the women who participated, who, who were recruited from the microfinance and got the gender empowerment training, they, their experience of physical partner violence was reduced by 55%, um, and, and which is you know, obviously very significant, although again, not down to zero. So none of our interventions, even those that have been highly successful and for example, halved levels of past year violence, you're still, if you're starting out with 40% of women experiencing violence, you're still ending with 20% or more. So um, it's important to kind of keep that in mind in terms of our need to continue to work towards zero. In this intervention, we also saw that the households themselves became less poor and there was less food insecurity and better communication. And it was also in this particular intervention, they were trying to affect not only IPV, but HIV. And so you saw a 64% increase in uptake of HIV testing and less unprotected sex. Um, interestingly enough, the impact on this did not seem to come from the, the microfinance. It was the microfinance together. So the microfinance alone had an impact on financial security of the household, but it didn't have an impact on IPV. It wasn't until the two were together that you saw the impact on the reduction of violence. So another type of intervention is parenting. And I think we're all familiar that there are a variety of, of, of programs to try to help prepare young people as they move into parenting. Um, most of the traditional parenting programs, however, have not really been very gender focused or gender aware. So they tend to focus on helping children be ready for school, um, early childhood development, or they may actually focus, to the extent to which they focus on violence against children themselves or harsh discipline, it's more about helping manage, uh, parents manage uh, problem behavior in children through positive reinforcement. Um, however, in the prevention collaborative, as well as in um, a, a uh, a growing number of people working in the parenting space, there is an effort to try to see and to adapt parenting um, and, and integrate a gender lens so that in addition to trying to reduce violence against children, that we would be able to both reduce violence in, um, against women in the family or partner violence as well as try to um, introduce, in, or, or, sorry, as well as try to work with parents to uh, ensure that they're not gender stereotyping children and that they're um, creating an environment that would promote gender equality. And, and it's important that we work on the intersection between violence against women and violence against children for the very reasons that I mentioned at the beginning, which is, is that you know, these two issues overlap a lot. They overlap partly because men who are violent towards partners also tend to be more or more likely to be violent against their children. Women who experience of IPV are also more likely to use harsh parenting. And then again, children who witness um, domestic violence are more likely to repeat the pattern. So given that, um, there are a few programs that are trying to innovate in this area. Um, this is one from the Banda Barejo program is from Rwanda. 
Um, and it is a, a variation on um, program P, which is something that was started by an international NGO called Promundo that works with men and, and fathers. Um, this program was actually 15 group sessions, um, participatory group sessions that worked both with men and couples. So some sessions were only with men as fathers and some were with couples. And what they were able to show through their impact evaluation was, again, less IPV. Um, they also were encouraging men to support women seeking antenatal care. So they, were, they did demonstrate that more men accompanied their wives to, um, to, uh, to the birth experience. There was less physical punishment of children, greater use of, of modern contraception, and higher levels of participation of men in childcare and household tasks. Okay, another approach, and, and this is the one that I think is probably the most widely known, is community level mobilization or activism. And, and this is designed to really shift harmful attitudes, behaviors, and norms that underpin gender inequality and violence, and, and hopefully to achieve sustained reduction of violence at the whole community level, or what we call population level, meaning amongst the whole population rather just than just amongst the people who would participate in the program, like the fathers in Banda Barejo. Um, and it really involves training volunteer community activists um, and, and they, they get, you know, skills and skill building and mentoring and they in turn work with other members of the community. And obviously the best known program of this sort is SASA, um, which has been adapted in many different parts of the world. Um, the reason SASA has gotten the attention that it has is because it has demonstrated, unlike other programs such as Stepping Stones or some of the things which have had positive impacts, but this is one that has been able to reduce levels of violence at a whole community level. And we actually only have three examples thus far um, where formal impact evaluation. I mean, these fancy studies have been able to demonstrate that levels have gone down. So one was the original SASA in Uganda, and SASA has just been revised. So it remains to be seen if I don't know if they'll want to do uh, more evaluation of the, the new version, but it's new, improved, and updated. Um, an adaptation of SASA that integrated Stratic Sasa with an HIV program also in a different region of Uganda in Rakai, and that was known as the SHARE trial. And then most recently, as part of the What Works program, there was an, there's an intervention, excuse me, done in Ghana, um, where similarly to Sasa, groups of individuals, usually around six or seven in a in a village or in a community are trained to be part of what are called community action teams. Um, and and they, that program has also shown a reduction in sexual violence, but not physical violence. So let me take you through a little bit of that research. So the one trial, the, the one evaluation that I was talking about is SHARE, or, or actually all three of them. One of the things that's the clearest lesson from all of this is that to actually have an impact on violence, you have to have what, what we call in epidemiology really intense exposure, meaning there has to be high contact rates and there have to be frequent contact rates. So one of the, the things that doesn't work is to pick sort of 
aspects of Sasa up and just sort of do them in a small way in a community. The, the areas where you've actually seen reductions, you see a very high intensity. So I just give you an example here from SHARE. So this is from Rakai, Uganda. And from the monitoring data, they were able to show that, and this is of everyone in the community, that 77% of everybody had heard of SHARE. So they knew the program. And of these, you know, a really high percentage had participated in SHARE activities. 87% personally knew a SHARE volunteer. You know, more than a quarter of people in the whole population had SHARE materials in their home. Um, you know, 50% of men reported talking with their partner about violence prevention. So these are the kinds of levels of intensity that you have to achieve to have an impact. Um, going on now to the SCANA program, what was slightly different about this than SASA is men and women were trained to work in teams. And there was a couple of elements to the combat program in Ghana. So the teams, they would go and they would both do similar things to Sasa where they would do, you know, village theater and they would challenge attitudes and they would educate women on the laws um, and their rights. But they also did home visits and they had and they did mediation and counseling of couples. Um, and I know in in the oftentimes in the feminist world, there's a real resistance or concern about the issue of, of mediation or, or, or counseling of couples. But in this set, setting in rural Ghana, it, it seemed to be a very effective thing, at least in terms of a component of this larger program. Um, they also facilitated referrals to police and health and the like. And, and what you see is they were able to reduce forced sex by partners by, was halved, so by 50%. And there was a reduction in physical violence, but it didn't uh, reach the level of, of what's called statistical significance, meaning it still is not as strong a finding. So there's an indication that it reduced physical violence, but, um, and there was no reported reduction in IPV perpetrated by men. And this is one of the odd things that we're seeing that you have to keep your eye open for in terms of reading evidence is sometimes what we'll see is the women report reductions, other times men report reductions, and sometimes both men and women report reductions. And so it's important to to when you're reading about a program and its impact, is it, is it that are men saying that they've been changing their behavior? Are women saying that the men in their lives are changing their behavior? And you know, sorting out exactly whose reports um, the information is based on. So going across those um, programs thus far, what we see is that, oops, sorry. Um, what we see is that the elements of success is really a very strong program design. So all of these are, are based on strong theories of change. There, there needs to be strategies that match the cultural context. So um, there were examples of things that didn't work and it's because they weren't well, they didn't anticipate sort of the context in which um, it needed to be implemented. Um, all of these and all of the, the, the studies or the approaches that had an impact in the What Works program, one of the most uh, important things was that they all had extensive training and support for the facilitators. So those people that were catalyzing these kinds of changes, whether they're the people running reflection groups, um, whether they're the community activists, 
Um, and preferably, the people who are the catalyst or the facilitator should have gone through the program themselves. Because we all grow up, obviously, in the environments, the same environment in which we're trying to change. And it's important for them to go on their own journey of, of, of transformation before they actually try to guide others through it. Um, again, as I said, sufficient duration, coverage, and intensity, and, and parallel support for victims and survivors. So all of them, in addition to focusing on prevention, they also had mechanisms in place to deal with women who came forward. And finally, I think all of the ones that have been successful to date have engaged leadership structures. So whether that be faith leaders, village heads, whomever it is that is seen as, as, as leaders in that setting. And so I think one of the most important things that I want to leave in terms of elements of success is that I think the most common reason that programs don't reduce violence has nothing to do with the program or program design, or we don't know to what extent it has to do with the program design, because they're just not implemented well enough. They're not implemented with enough intensity or coverage to actually have an impact. Lori, this has been a really incredible session. I feel like we've, you've taken us through sort of a master class on prevention. This is um, wonderful. There's so many uh, looks of appreciation around the, the room here in Bangkok, um, and I'm sure our colleagues across the region are feeling similarly. Thank you for all the colleagues for around the region who devoted your time to this as well. Yeah, but thank you all. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Lori. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye.